Thank you, Susan. If I ever needed a PR agent, I know where I should go. <laughs> um, so this is um, the low blood sugar hour. And <laughs> it's my obligation to entertain you in some ways. But I can only entertain through hoping to give you an uh, interesting lecture that you'll find interest. I can't dance on the table. I can't do anything like that. So let's just uh, jump into it. My topic today is the relative importance of covariate choice, reliable to covariates, and mode of beam analysis. And the major purpose today is to use the long type studies, there'll be 26 of them, to examine the relative importance of covariate choice, reliable to covariates, and mode of data analysis. A minor theme is to identify which classes of covariates are usually more important in bias reduction. And a second minor theme is to, dis if we've got time, is to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of the long type studies for investigating the removal of selection bias. The presentation will be structured for a briefly explicate what a long type study is. I'll explicate in more detail the main purpose of today's presentation in terms of uh, covariates, modern data counts, et cetera. I'll present results from a particular type of Lalande study and its replication in Berlin to, that speak to the main purposes of the talk. Now, briefly assess the generality of the results across 24 other Lalande type studies of less sophisticated design. And as I said, I'll discuss what these Lalande type studies are and are good for. So part one is what's a Lalande type study? Uh, these studies empirically investigate the extent of selection bias removal in an observational study by directly comparing its causal estimate to an experiment. This gentleman running the uh, canvas told me I have to face it. So, no move back here. It's not my nature. I put this between me and the audience. I hate it, but I've got to do it. And in these online type studies, um, you have, an, uh, you want to compare an observational studies estimate with that of an experiment. The same treatment group is used in the experiment and non-experiment, right? So what you're really doing is comparing the different forms of creating a comparison group since the treatment is held constant. And statistical adjustments are usually made for selection in the observational study. So the name of the game is to see the degree of correspondence between the results in the experiment and the statistically adjusted non-experiment, um, where the hope is that these statistical adjustments will reduce or minimize selection bias. So the study examines variation in how a comparison group is formed, at random or not, and then assesses, assesses the equivalence of causal estimates while holding many, many other factors constant come back to that later. Here's the structure of a Lalonde uh, type study. We'll call it a three arm uh, within study comparison. What you have here is some population out of which a randomized experiment is created in which people are randomly assigned to the control group and the treatment group. Now from the same population systematically, not randomly, a comparison group is drawn. Now you can imagine here two intent to treat estimates. Arms one and two are the control and treatment group in the original experiment, and they obviously have a, 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 an estimate of the difference between them. You can also do an intent to treat estimate for the observational study where you compare the treatment group in the randomized experiment with the statistically adjusted comparison group from the non-experiment where you try to model selection differences, or, as we're going to see later, to minimize the differences and maximize the overlap by how you've chosen comparison groups to start with. There are six criteria in the literature for a better long type study of this three-armed variant. Um, the experiment is being used as a benchmark against which to evaluate the adjusted non-experimental results. So that experiment has to meet the usual requirements for being a damn good experiment. Otherwise, it cannot function as it's supposed to. 
And the observational study has to be a very good one of its type, because there's not much point to comparing a very good randomized experiment with a second-rate observational study, because you're then you're not comparing the methods, you're confounding it with the quality with which each of them is done. That's tougher. There have to be no irrelevant sources of between method variation due to, say, testing or timing. In the original studies, the comparison group was formed from an administrative data set where the data was collected at different times in the experiment, sometimes even on a different measure than the experiment, though purportedly of the same construct, but a different measure. And so you were confounding the experiment and the non-experiment with the timing of measurement, the nature of measurement, place, and a lot of other things. And if you want to compare methods directly, obviously, you would like to be without this confounding. Each method has to estimate the same causal quantity. That is, the estimate has to be the same. Right? I remember being, uh, being excoriated by Jeff Smith here in a meeting in Paris, where he told me that when we went through some comparing the results of randomized experiments with the regression discontinuity studies, uh, they were estimating different things, as indeed they were. One is the average treatment effect, and one is the effect at the cutoff point. So if you don't want to confound the estimate and the mode of uh, uh, design, then they've got to be estimated the same cause of quantity. The analyst of each method should be blind to the results of the other method. That is, we know from lots of studies going back many years in social psychology that the expectations scholars have for their data influence the data they get and the results they generate. Bob Rosenthal showed that 40 years ago. And it's been repeated many times since then. So it is very important that the person who analyzes and describes the effect size in the randomized experiment, be blind to the results in the, in, in the uh, statistically adjusted quasar experiment. Okay. And the last thing is there have to be clear and defensible standards for concluding that the two causal estimates differ or do not differ. Now, there's a lot of different standards used in this literature. It would take me 15 minutes to go into them. I'm not going to go into them here but it is a very important issue and one of the weakest in the literature. This is a daunting list of criteria for a good study. But the studies have been getting progressively better since Lalande, especially for controlling for confounds between the experiment and non-experiment, confounds of testing, uh, measurement, and the like. A surprising mm -hmm. number of experiments in this literature are less balanced than they claim. Right? Therefore, the experiment cannot stand as a good benchmark for saying that this is the true causal estimate. It's still a minority of the experiments, but across the 26th, I am surprised at this. And uh, Don Rubin has uh, a uh, little piece on a paper that I actually funded, Shadish, Clark, and uh, Steiner, the appeared in JASA in December 2008, um, in which he points that out in one of the studies. And in a review I did of these studies, I showed you about four of 12 experiments. So we've got to be very careful about uh, not believing that somebody, because somebody said they did an experiment, that they did a good experiment that can stand as a benchmark. Blindness is still rare. I only know two studies. Many of the non-experiments are compared to experiments are forgive my bluntness, but I want to be blunt to really make the point, are pretty shitty. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be heroic to expect statistical adjustments to uh, give the same results as an experiment. Guess I got that point across, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there are very variable standards for claiming the correspondence between the two causal estimates. Now, as part of this improvement of the Lalonde type tradition, a forearm study evolved. And in the forearm version of uh, this design, what you have now is a population, out of a population, groups are randomly assigned to being in a randomized experiment or to being in an observational study. Right? Very important. You can see why. Right? In the randomized experiment, people are then assigned to the treatment group or control group. 
And in the observational study, let's say the self-selection into treatment, uh, in the, in, in the uh, observational study with self-selection into treatment, they go to the same treatment and same control. control. Now, in the best of these studies, they undergo the treatment at the same place, at the same time, in the same groups. Right? And the measurement takes place, whether it's the measurement of covariates before or the measurement of the outcome at the end. The measurement takes place at the same place in the same way, etc. So really, the only thing that varies between them is the mode of assignment into treatment, which is the contrast of interest in this literature. The four-arm study has obvious advantages over the three-arm study. I'm not going to go into that. And our intent to today is to examine one four-arm study in detail, plus a German replication of it, which turns out to be a lab-like study with a short-lasting intervention. And that's not the domain to which I want to generalize these kinds of results. So I also want to help you I will also uh, show you replication of the findings across two reviews of the three arm studies. One is a uh, meta-analysis of job training evaluations by Glazmanel, which involves 12 along type three arm studies. And the other, which I did in more domains than Glazmanel afterwards, uh, um, uh, again involving uh, 12 contracts. Because for me, in all science, replication is the watchword. And replication across heterogeneous instances of what is the treatment, what are the subject population studies, what are the times at which the study takes place, what are the variants of the intervention under analysis, and what are the, ver what are the different kinds of outcomes examined. Right? Only this way will we get an empirically robust social science. So here's our substantive problem. We all know that covariate choice matters for selection, right? We have this concern that Josh brought up today so well with hidden bias, missing variables, strong ignorability, poor ignorability. And the theory of covariate choice is clear. If the selection process is fully known, then it can be easily modeled. The randomized experiment is a case of a fully known selection process. Regression discontinuity is a case of fully known selection process. There are variables in the literature, like the Diaz and Hunter examination of the Oportunidades Mexican experiment, where the process of assignment and treatment was completely known. It depended upon an index of material hardship. And they could go, and using this index of material hardship, they could show in villages that were not equivalent to those studies, you get the same results as in the randomized experiment, because the selection process depends upon this measure of material hardship which they had to use with the comparison group so it became uh, no different from the randomly formed control group. That's a rare event. Pray for it, my friends. Don't expect it. <laughs> or we know that it will work if we have all, car all non redundant correlates of selection with a correlated outcome. Now that's rather abstract and blue sky. <laughs> it's a matter of like good ideas of tying it down in practice, right? There are claims in the literature that some covariates are better for index and selection, all other things being equal, and are useful for guiding practice. And Jeff has done a lot of this with Petra Todd and Jim Heckman uh, at the turn of the century. I just feel old, right? Turn of the century. <laughs> <laughs> Almost an antique. <laughs> right? Pre test measures of outcome, local <laughs> comparison groups, etc. And there's claims in a lot of literature that studies have tried to use just demographic variables to control for selection processes. Almost always, if not always, across these 26 studies, do a pretty poor job. Um, we also know that measurement error matters. Because uh, it attenuates bias reduction in OLS context. We know that. Um, and we know that its effects are reduced by moving to multiple measurement contexts, latent variables, and the like. Um, and so this raises the question, one of the modes of data analysis we're going to look at is propensity scores. We're going to look at it done um, with uh, matching, stratification, weighting, um, and similar covariance. We're going to look at other methods besides propensity scores. But we know that propensity score 
is a composite of many variables indexing the selection process. So the question is, because that is a composite of many variables, right, has all these properties of reliability about it, uh, it's not a, 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 a direct measure of uh, the true but unknown latent uh, selection model. But the issue is, because this is a multivariate um, issue, uh, will it make the problems of measurement error go away or be reduced? We know that the mode of data analysis matters. There's so much statistical theory. We know that ordinary squares methods are sensitive to missing covariates, functional form assumptions, errors in variables, etc. The case for the theoretical case for propensity stores is obviously that it's non-parametric, and the uh, common support uh, assumption uh, entails no extrapolation. But we also know it's sensitive to missing covariates from the mobility. Balance has to be really good, and there's a lot of pretty poor practice out there balancing, and we're not clear about the role of covariance. Theory tells us a lot about this, um, and so we know that data analysis can matter. The issue is, across a lot of practice, does it matter as much, right? In the hands of pretty competent analysts who are not sort of mindlessly, stupidly, committing baby sins, right? Can't be baby sins, right? All sins are sins, right? Anyway, I'm not enough. Um, <laughs> so when we know, or oh, a lot of people spend a lot of time worrying about propensity scores, whether we should do with matching, stratification, weighting, or what, and the issue is, uh, do these make a difference, or are they all dancing on the head of a pin? What we don't know is the relative priority of these factors. We don't know which kinds of covariates make more of a difference in practice. We're not quite sure exactly in all ways of how um, bias is related to errors in covariates when uh, you start working with composites like, an, uh, like a, uh, a propensity score is. And we don't uh, we're going to investigate which modes of data analysis among a finite set of causal ones reduce bias by more. We're going to use 26 studies, as I've said, two four-arm long type studies, but they're quite lab-like, and 24 three-arm ones uh, conducted in real-world settings, uh, treatments last a long time, and the involved outcomes are society true values. But it's obviously not a random sample of all, pop, all possible applications of non-experimental methods. Right? It's just a heterogeneous collection, that's all. Right? Um, and in these other 24 studies, the focus on measurement error is much rarer than the focus on covariate selection and manner of data analysis. So here's the lab-like forearm study. Here's the first one, this uh, Schadisch, Clark, and Steiner came up that uh, when everybody to know, I funded. <laughs> um, he said, well, well, I guess funded it, but my grand funded it. Um, and um, here there were 445 undergrad psychology students who were randomly assigned to an experiment or an observational study. And this was not a treatment control study. This was a replicated treatment study. They were randomly assigned to getting training in mathematics or to getting training in vocabulary, right? or they self-selected themselves into math training or vocabulary training. And you can see from the sample sizes that the self-selection process was clearly out of mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> it's a large private we did Western not, university. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this was a large public university. Uh -huh. <laughs> in Germany, by the way, this kind of selection out of mathematics did not take place in the German <laughs> Interesting, right? Um, all for contextualizing cause and right? So in, in this kind of setup, the math outcome measure serves as a measure of treatment effect for the math people, and the vocab outcome measure for those who get math training serves as the no treatment comparison outcome for those who get vocabulary training, right? So this has a built-in little replication. Okay? And the question you know is, 
whether the average treatment effect for the randomized experiment is different from the average treatment effect for the observational study after it has been adjusted for selection. Okay, so uh, the outcomes were a vocabulary test and mathematics test geared to the uh, treatment. The covariates were pretty extensive uh, because we're really worried about strong ignorability. <laughs> Uh, there were five construct domains with 23 constructs across these domains and 156 questionnaire and items, and there were archival measures too. These were measured, of course, before students were randomly assigned to treatment. Uh, the construct domains were demographics, uh, some single item constructs that had to used to. There were proxy pretests. These were a 36 item vocabulary test. Not the same as the outcome measure. That's why in this literature it's called proxy pretest. It's the same domain, but it's not the same measure or an equivalent form of the same measure. And an arithmetic aptitude test. Whose prior academic achievement, which we're calling a separate domain, high school GPA, current college GPA, ACT college admission scores. Topic preference was to get at motivational factors as part of the selection process, liking literature, liking mathematics, preferring mathematics over literature, number of prior mathematics courses taken, blah, blah, blah. The last was psychological predisposition, a common psychology test, because we were interested in, in general, but in particular, there's a conscientiousness scale here that we thought might make a big difference. And uh, so this was the five domains and 23 uh, constructs collected to get at selection. Uh, did the study work? Well, just show you here briefly. Um, in the covariance adjusted randomized experiment, the groups were equivalent. The covariance adjustment is about uh, uh, power. Um, you see here that the, this is for the vocabulary outcome. To the randomized experiment, effect size is 8.15. In the other adjusted observation study, the effect was 9. So there was 0.85 units of selection. And you can see what that we're... Unit of no, these are number of items correct on the test. Okay? And you can see with three forms of propensity score analysis, gravitation and cover weighting, they all get very close to the result. But so did simple ANCOVA without using propensity scores. For mathematics, it's basically the same story. There's an almost one unit difference between the experiment and the observational study. And the use of the covariates made the difference go away. Right? So here's a case of successful um, reduction of selection bias. You might want to define ANCOVA for the time. Oh, analysis of covariance. Regression. Regression. Yeah. There's a dummy here. Some of those are one of an efficient to Boring, boring. Are you serious? Yeah. 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 The economists never heard of that. No, we never use it. No, no. The economists don't use it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> So now let's look at the relative importance of these factors I talked about for ruling out hidden bias through selection constructs and reliability, and for avoiding overt bias through balancing and they were analytic methods. Um, here is data for the vocabulary outcome. And this is a little complicated. You'll see each of these looking at the camera, each of these boxes here, <laughs> inside which are four numbers. These numbers correspond to the mode of data analysis, the mode of data analysis. And you can see there that it makes very, very little difference across this. Looking at the camera still. <laughs> here, you will see taken singly each of the construct domains. Psychological, the academic background, the demographic, <coughs> The proxy pretest. This is the motivational uh, domain, right? And now we combine them into twos in constructing our propensity scores. 
then into threes, four, five. Okay? What you saw before in the results I just presented to you was this, where all of the covariates were used and the bias was almost completely reduced. Right? Now, what would have happened if you just had psychological measures? And you can see that uh, this is 100% uh, of the bias reduced. This is none of the bias reduced. You can see that they wouldn't have done very well. None of them taken singly would have done very well for vocabulary. These two, the proxy pretest information and the motivation to self-select into uh, mathematics or literature, they do best for a count of about 60% of the learners. Now we start combining them to get this heterogeneity one looks for if one doesn't have uh, prior knowledge of the selection process. And you can see that combining two of them starts getting better. If you combine these here, the pretest, proxy pretest, and your academic performance prior to coming, it gets rid of most of the variance, most of the bias. And if you just combine the best two, pretest and the motivational one, you do as well as having all the others. But then you start taking um, uh, these, here, including one of the better ones, the pretest or the uh, motivational one, and you start hitting very close. Right? So the covariates are making a big difference. The covariates take you from 30% bias reduction to 100% bias reduction. Let's look at it from that, but it's striking. The selection process into treatment here is completely symmetrical. <laughs> the correlations with the outcome differ. So you have what you have in math here is any single one wasn't doing anything. But if you get the motivation, and I'm going to show you later, one item, one item out of all these 156, one item reduced all the bias. Right? Retrospectively. If only we were gods and knew this prospectively. But retrospectively, right, one item is doing it. Right? Now, if you combine the other dimensions, right, that do not include the motivational one. So this is here the demographics, the pretesting out here in the background. It's doing okay. So combine the demographics, pretest, and oh, that's got the top in. Oh, that will get the top in. But this is doing quite well, without it, but not as well as with it, right? That is crucial. And now we're looking at single uh, items within the constructs that made more of a difference. Among the proxy pretests for the vocabulary outcome, knowing the vocabulary pretest score got rid of 75% of the variance. That's one <coughs> 15 item. Uh, uh, pretest score. Right? None of the other things did very well. When you have, uh, uh, but if you have the uh, preference for mathematics, for by itself it does pretty well. Um, these are the proxy pretest measures. These are the top of preference. Sorry, Cameron. Um, and these are all covariates here, taking. This is all the covariates together, taking out just the preference for mathematics. No, this is all the covariates together, taking out both of them, right? And you're doing pretty well. Take out the preference for math, right? Which is the, uh, sorry, the vocab pre. This was the important one. If you take it out, right? All the other covariates do pretty well. So the remainder do pretty well when you've taken out the one, which is the most important one. So the rest of the was exploring two mechanisms. One is a knowledge of the selection process, and the other one is just a bundling of heterogeneity. For mathematics, it's even more striking. <coughs> uh, the, here, the pretest doesn't do very much. But these motivational items, preference for mathematics and liking mathematics, boom, right? These are single items now, right, that are doing it and combine almost anything and you're doing very well. Take out the two that work and the best 
best, which are likely math and preferred mathematics. So you've taken out the two really good ones, and you're left with the rest. And the rest does as well as the two good ones. Right? There's two pathways. OK. So uh, reliability. Um, I'll just tell you what we did. Uh, using the uh, 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 This one? Work made. Previous slide. About how the method is more uh, Well, in all of these, it's yeah. the same. The method. The, method. the method doesn't count. The method. The method. Yes. Yeah. And you're going to see this across 26 times. That matters what the controls are. Right. It's called red counts. That's the method. That's, that's, that's why we're doing it at the server at the time. What data you collect is more important than what method you use. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you can say that in a different way, but we're going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the language of design trumps analysis. We're going to use the language you can't put right by statistics what you've got wrong by design. I mean, those are very old messages, but boy, oh boy, they need to be trumpeted. And uh, a certain discipline, which will be nameless, between about 1970 and 1990 went berserk. Anyway. <laughs> but it, it, listen, listen, the applied microeconomists have made a huge journey over the last 20 years. They have changed more for the good than any other discipline I know. It's, uh, I am in awe of their change, given the sources of resistance that were meant in the field. It's just amazing. But anyway, that's sort of sociology of science, and we're not doing that talk today. <laughs> reliability. Um, so um, what we did for the reliability part of the study is to say, um, well, this is a series of five papers, but didn't I? Is um, basically took that last study, the four-hour study, and did a simulation using many, many, many of its details. But we created the simulation so that the uh, covariates we just looked at uh, were measured without error and removed 100% of the selection bias. What we then did is vary the amounts of random error we introduced into each of the measures, going from none, which is reliability of 1, 0.8, 0.9, 0.8, 0.7, 0.6, 0 0.5. So we deliberately induce variation in the amount of measurement error from a base of no bias. And we want to see what bias gets built in as we do this. Um, here are the results for vocabulary with reliability of 1. We've seen these before. Reliability of 0.9. And looking at the camera, what we're doing here is showing you how it changes. This is the reliability of 1. Okay, and we're going through. Get the last one. Now, what you're seeing here is regression to 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 the unadjusted uh, uh, value. Right? Everything's regressing. For those for which there's even a little bit of uh, overprediction, it too is regressing <coughs> towards the unadjusted uh, effect size from the quasar experiments. And what that implies is, and what you also find is that there's a greater amount of, uh, of inefficacy in bias reduction, the better the variable is at bias reduction. So the variables that are most effective in bias reduction are the variables most hurt by unreliability in the measurement. And you can see that all of these up here are having bigger drops in it. Oh, this is separate. This is demography. We assume that you measure uh, gender, race, etc. 0.99, so there's no. Be stupid. <laughs> Take that. Race? It, race is hard, um, but it's not that hard. It depends on the <laughs> I'm all for all kinds of multi-racial uh, categories. Um, mathematics, 
the same story, right? You can see it all converging in, right? So you get this regression phenomenon on the one hand, you get this uh, uh, diminution of bias reduction, and the diminution of bias reduction is greater, the better the variable is at bias reduction, right? And um, you get it across all methods too, basically. Um, and um, uh, in the propensity scores, uh, the more the variables in the propensity scores, the less you get it. It doesn't disappear, but it's less. So the conclusion here on reliability is measurement error attenuates the covariance potential reducing bias. The measurement of a set of interrelated covariates compensates but does so only partially in this particular study. The reliability of effective covariates matters most, and the choice of analytic method, again, is less important. Now, there's a replication in Berlin of this by Paul Steiner, Eisenman, Zerner, and Cook. Should I be Koch in this one? <laughs> then, um, which is basically the same design, uh, but an English intervention instead of vocab. There's no positive selection into English or all methods. Um, but basically it's the same story, this is in press right now, the same covariance reduced bias in math as you see. The reliability variation had the same effects of here and the mode of data analysis did not matter. So this is replicated in the same sort of lab-like, uh, tight-ass um, <laughs> sort of forearm design. So do these results replicate beyond the lab and beyond short-term treatment? Well, there are two relevant reviews. The first one is by Glazeman, Levy, and Myers. It's not a fantastically good study. Uh, it's okay. It's a meta-analysis of 12 long-term job training evaluations using a Lalonde type 3 arm design. Their conclusion was that no adjusted observational study ever met their own criteria of correspondence with the experimental results. And this was a very important study within the IES, uh, oft quoted to justify an experiments only policy. Um, and, um, uh, but some types of covariance did better than others, and you can see this, especially pretests and local matches. Some did worse, the so called demographic predictors when used to be wrong. And they themselves concluded that no form of data analysis did better than others across all of these within study comparisons. They did not analyze the effect of measurement error in the predictors. So they're clearly saying covariance matter, some covariance matter more than others, and that data analysis matter. We did a paper in JPON, um, uh, which is uh, 12 experimental, non-experimental, uh, the long type comparisons, uh, only one of them lab-like, over multiple outcomes and domains. And the conclusions were the experiments and regression discontinuity generally produce comparable results in three of three comparisons, two of which are yet unpublished, one of which, come on, it's coming, <laughs> it's been coming a long while, I feel like it's one of those. It's kind of make me feel old. It's one of those. It's like one of those Viagra ads. You know, <laughs> six hours. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> so right, exactly. <laughs> Having full knowledge of the selection process did in two out of two studies, where you had independent knowledge of what the selection process was, and you could use it. It's trivial then to model the selection process. And this was um, a uh, correspondence with results where you involved focal local intact group matching. And this is a strategy, not the purpose of the talk here, but here the strategy is to pick is to match intact groups and to begin with minimal with maximal overlap between the comparison and the treatment group before you start it and not get into this game of having to adjust away larger and larger difference. Uh, they again found that having a pretest match and local matches help, and they too found no variation in results due to the mode of data analysis. So my general conclusions, I 
Given that you don't have a strong design, like random assignment or regression to study the unit, it is pretty clear, but I'm not going to get a Nobel Prize, for saying that the selection of construct is the most important issue for establishing strong ignorability. Right? And that the selection of constructs matters more the bigger the difference is initially between the non-equivalent comparison group and the treatment group. The next most important factor is their reliable measurement. Right? You might come from a tradition that treats unreliability as just another missing verb. Right? And that's fine, but it's just another way of saying that if it's a missing variable, it is a missing variable. And that has implications in this literature. And at least choosing among three propensity score techniques or multiple regression, um, there doesn't seem to be much importance in how you do the analyses. And there doesn't seem to be much, at this point, be over difference between the, therefore, between propensity score and the ANCOVA method, which sort of implies that the people in this literature, at least these 26 studies, and I'm not widely generalizing beyond these 26 persons, are, could perhaps be better than average at checking the assumptions and being careful in the way they do the analysis. And it may be a self-selection process whereby people are methodologically better go into doing these Lalonde type studies. Though some of the Lalonde type studies are carried out so poorly, I find it hard to believe, but there may be something there, right? So, what type of covariance work better? Well, when you have full or near complete independent knowledge of the selection process. It was no accident in the Shadish et al. paper that those measures of motivation to uh, get into math were there, because they sat down and thought through what are the mechanisms, plural, 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 by which you get into treatment, and then trying to measure all of those heterogeneous processes. And often you can't do that when you rely on an administrative data set. You get what is in there. And that's why also often we've had these schlocky studies throwing in a few dem demographic variables and calling that a defensive score, calling it a, a regression adjustment. Um, it's, uh, uh, it requires knowledge of theory and knowledge of the grounded practice of selection in a particular substantive area of study. I always say you cannot be a quantitative researcher without being the cultural anthropologist of the topic you study. Right? If you're not an anthropologist, you shouldn't be in science. That's a little. Forget it. No one's sleeping now. That was a good one. <laughs> but I honestly believe it. You've got to be knee deep in the muddy of the substantive area state. Then the importance of sampling intact groups for maximal overlap on the highest predictors of outcomes. That's the sampling design of your study before you get into measurement and uh, adjustment. Then you need pretest measures for the outcome close proxies that are, and you need lo local case matches rather than distant ones in place or time or uh, where the data are stored or collected. So the implication for practice is clear. You need strong theories, expert knowledge, direct investigation, selection process, and outcome model. Um, I've said all these things, right? Um, however, the reliable measurement of all confounders is necessary but not sufficient. You really have to do these studies well. That is, you've got to achieve balance on all the observed baseline numbers. When I look at published uh, propensity score studies, and um, I am not overwhelmed by the curve with which balancing is done and how well people know uh, modern balance criteria and how well they adhere to. So these things are also obviously very important, uh, like uh, 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 functional forms are clearly in OLS. Now, have I got a minute left, or should I end that? That's a natural ending. This is an appendage. <laughs> how long is the appendage? <laughs> Three slides. Sorry. So what are these within-study comparisons good for? 
Now, I don't have an good answer. I'm writing a paper on that right now. I'm in a total fog. So I hope somebody will say something that will turn the light switch on in my mind. But I'm not sure the worst very much since uh, the so dependent on theory. Um, that is, uh, OL OLS and propensity scores uh, might give the same results if each is biased, or the assumptions of neither are violated. Theory specifies when they're going to give the same results, and it's no big deal to show when they do or when they don't. In RD, theory says the estimates are the same. If they turn out to be dissimilar, then we know that the assumptions of one of the methods has been violated, and we'll have clues as to identifying which of them, and we go into it. But, so there's a lot to this argument, but it's also points straight away that you can't do these alone type studies without knowing the statistical theory behind it all. Uh, the, the methods and the contrast. Um, you, you've got to know that. Yeah. Uh, have they done a good job to date in improving theory? In my view, there haven't been any Lalonde type studies that have sharply tested in a, in a Popperian sort of way. They've sharply tested differential predictions to date about bias reduction. Yeah. We have just done a relative ordering. There's, um, I have not seen any new inductions from the long type of theories that would make people say, aha, we ought to adjust our statistical theories of working with bias. So the contribution to theory has been uh, minimal. Now, new theoretical insights can come from anywhere, anywhere. I'm a great believer in that popular sense that uh, uh, where you get questions from is pretty irrelevant. How you test them is not, but but there's no privilege yet that can be accorded to the long type studies in the development of better theory that I've been able to see. They are better for guiding practical method choice at the margin, together with theory. Um, the uh, it helps us supplement theory as a rationale for method choice. Um, it helps guys priorities and tells us we've got to look in design such as the experimental design, the sampling design, and the measurement design. Those are the three big design building blocks we've got to think about. And it does help us point towards what are the design features that help, what are the sampling procedures that help, what are the constructs to be measured, things that help. It points us a little in direction. But most of all, it does highlight for me this old mantra that I'm going to give you again, that design trumps analysis. That's in Rubin's work. Uh, he uses design in a somewhat different sense from Dick Light. When Dick Light says, you can't, oh, and Fred Mostel has said, you can't put right the statistics of what you've done wrong by design. In causal work, design rules. And so students should learn the rules of design. But I think the Lalonde type studies have a modest role to play. It's not clear to me <coughs> they have a great role to play in developing new theories. 